Yeah, it's a really nice deck. Hello, good evening, dear guests. We are going to begin in about two, three minutes, so please take your seats. You do, yes, and we'll give you your hands. We have one, yeah. Katy Perry. <laughs> Testing. I'm Katy Perry. It's the Super Bowl. Hi. It's. But you 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 you'll be able to adjust it. Okay. Turn it off. Dear guests, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're going to live stream this event. So we would like to start at 6 o'clock. And please start taking your seats so that we also see how many additional chairs we need to put out. Thank you.
Okay, good evening, everyone. Well, thank you very much for joining us here in San Mateo, and uh, thank you those of you who are watching us online. Uh, my name is Marina Gear, and I'm part of the team here at Silicon Valley Innovation Center, the company that is organizing this event tonight. Uh, apart from speaker series events, we also uh, organize uh, executive trainings and educational programs in innovation and trends. If you or someone wants to participate, please feel free to come talk with me or my colleagues here after the event. And now uh, I'm honored to introduce to you our wonderful speaker today, Julie Trell. Uh, Julie, uh, whose career in corporate philanthropy started as a founding member of Salesforce Foundation in 2000, uh, where she launched the award-winning employee volunteer program. Also, Julie built and led the signature Salesforce Foundation Biz Academy program for high school students. Uh, after 12 years at Salesforce, uh, she joined um, executive, as an executive director of the uh, Workday Foundation. And right now, Julie works with emerging companies to design innovative, integrated philanthropy programs. And as far as I know, she's about to graduate a national school for creative Future. leaders based in Vancouver. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, I think. T-H-N-K. And uh, giving it over to Julie. Thank you, Marina. Um, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I got this. This is my Katy Perry Madonna moment. I just, I'm trying to get used to this. <laughs> Um, so before I begin, I take a little poll. Thank you for those of you that filled out this survey before uh, you got here. This is, I wanted to just get an idea who is in the room because I want to make sure that we also do have a chance to do some networking. So let me see if we can get the technology to work. So this is, um, just to get an idea who's here, I, a lot of leaders in, from nonprofit. Raise your hand if you're from a leader in a nonprofit. I know I've spoken to a handful of you, and everyone look around because you're at the end, and so you can have these conversations. Social entrepreneurs, and I know some people are wearing more, wearing more than one hat. CEO or founders of young companies. Who are they? Okay, great. Um, people just curious nearby, just want to drop in. Cool. Uh, corporate refugee, those that are, you know, stuck, tired of the corporate grind and wanted to do something good, try try out something new. Raise your hand. Really big. Good. Um, we have a couple of millennials. Little millennials? Oh, yes. <laughs> grant makers. Those grant makers are, I don't want to raise their hand too high because people are going to ask them for money. I know, right? Um, we have some, two people, executive senior levels at a corporate foundation. I think I spoke with one or two. And um, we have one VC in here. I would love to fill the room one time with VCs. That would be cool. Um, let me go. Okay. So that's who is in the room. And so this is, the, the, the talk is about how to integrate philanthropy into your enterprise and make a social impact. And um, as Maureen introduced me, I am Julie Trell. If this is this, this, the talk that you're here for, welcome. If this is not the talk you're here for, welcome. Um, before I begin, I wanted to talk about, there's two words that I wanted to set the definition of, is, and that's philanthropy. The, the origin of the word philanthropy means love of humanity. And um, oh, I forgot my notes. Hold on one second. In my bag, I have my, my um, the, the notes from the page. Um, and it's not, the, the term today, philanthropy, you think of people writing checks, whereas it's really about taking care of humanity in the sense of nourishing, developing, and enhancing what it is to be human. And this is both for the beneficiaries and the benefactor that is involved with, with giving. So the giver and the receiver. So keep that in mind when we're talking about philanthropy. I just want to cheat. Um, and the other word is integrate. And it's, this is really important because it goes through my story of how I've integrated stuff throughout my career. And it's bringing a meld with a part to a, to a, a dominant culture. And the two cultures that I'm going to be talking about is business and also curriculum in school. So the way that I'm going to do this talk is give you a little bit of my story, my very serendipitous story, how I've integrated stuff, how I've done some programs, give some examples of case studies of how other businesses have done well, have, and also some things that didn't go so well. So those are always fun to learn from. 
So my story, I see some giggling, you know, this, this uh, gold computer. My story, I'm going to start in 1996. I was a technology specialist in a middle school. Not having any formal training, I was prior to that, I was in an elementary school as a teacher in inner city Atlanta, where I felt I did a little bit more disciplining than teaching. But it was fun to use the computer, and I saw how this was a great tool to get some of the kids motivated. But mostly what was happening was this computer, and yes, they were Apple IIEs at the time, were in the back of the, uh, back of the room, and they were used as babysitters almost. Oh, you finished your work, go and, and play in the computer. And I saw it as a tool. When I got to the middle school, I worked with teachers and to show them that, you know, those kids that aren't finishing their, their work in time or aren't finishing their, kid, the, their work, they don't get to play. It's not fair. So I worked with the teachers how to take this tool. Not an, it was an expensive pencil, essentially. How to take this tool and use it to integrate it in the classroom so they could get work done. Yes, I was managing Apple IIEs. I actually ripped them out. We put, them, we put in Max 575. Still, everything was wired. We didn't have wireless yet. I was running CC mail on an LC2 server. Um, and, uh, so, but it was a lot of fun. I saw the light bulb go on when I would work with teachers just to give them a little bit of, to take away the fear, how to open a document, how to save it, where to save it, and work with the students and let them kind of take charge sometimes and have the teacher no longer be the sage on the stage but the guide on the side and let them be comfortable with that and where they can learn from the students as well. We did, we used games, um, programs like Hyper Studio, so there was more collaborative learning. And though that's that child that wasn't able to ever play on the computer, I, I believe in play. I think we, we forget to play a lot of times when we get older. Play is important, but we want to make sure everyone has an opportunity. And so what, when I got the teachers to step aside and let it be very collaborative, um, the, the fundamental purpose of school is learning, not teaching. And it was really exciting to watch both the teachers get excited to see their kids' light bulbs go on, or when they learned how to do a little bit of HTML. I knew enough to be dangerous, but really exciting. You know, opening up a text document, a text file in a browser, and you can change the color, and you can make a link. And the teachers and the kids got really excited with that. And so they, they, they got really excited that they could use this tool to be a new way of teaching and learning. Um, so that was, that was um, Richard Dufour, who's a, a, a research, um, research, does research for uh, collaborative learning. So one summer, since I have a teacher summers off, I went to Israel. And I was uh, there for about two weeks. And I was in, the, in this hotel. There was a whole bunch of different buses from around the world. I was on the Atlanta bus. And I met this gentleman, this very tall, very present gentleman named Mark Benioff. And I said, oh, what have you been doing today? How is your day in Israel? We are in Jerusalem. Oh, my God, I was just out in the West Bank installing these NC machines in these classrooms. I work for Oracle. And I said, what's Oracle? <laughs> I, had, um, I mean, why would I know what Oracle was? I was a technology specialist in a middle school in Atlanta. Mind you, it's 1998. He fluffs himself up. It's only the second largest software company in the world. Okay. I was not impressed with that. I was more impressed and excited about the, te the, the NCs, these network computers being installed in the schools in the West Bank. And I said, are you teaching the teachers? You can't just give computers to teachers. You need to teach them. You have to integrate it. It's, just, it's not just a tool that you can give to them. So the following summer, I flew myself back out to Israel. Summer's off. And I worked with the schools in the West Bank, and it was really exciting. Um, again, I taught them a little bit to be dangerous, so they knew how to use this tool. I ran into Mark about 10 months later at another conference, and he says, all right, I've left Oracle. I've started a new business, a new company, and I want to start a foundation. This is in 2000. I want to start and I want to bridge the digital divide. I want to deal with kids and teachers. And I said, Mark, that's great. Again, not knowing really anything about the technology world, just I was a teacher in Atlanta. I said, but Mark, if you're going to start a foundation and dealing with kids in technology, don't just be a company that gives away money. You need to hire teachers so you know, you know your clients. Little did I know that was my interview. <laughs> and he hired me. And um, finished out my school year. Three months later, I packed up my apartment, my car, my cat. And we moved out to San Francisco. And 
And uh, I want to make sure that I don't forget anything. And so Mark had this vision in his already. He knew that he wanted to start a new kind of company and based on a three-legged stool. And the three-legged stool had a new kind of business, a new kind of technology, and a new kind of philanthropy. The new kind of technology was, we're going to deliver software over the web. And that was the word they used, SaaS, software as a service. Cloud wasn't even a word yet. It wasn't marketed yet. A new kind of business. So while we're, rent, while we're providing, delivering the software over the internet, we're going to charge them monthly, subscription-based. This was also a new model. There, he was way ahead. And a new kind of philanthropy. We're going to start a foundation. I want to start giving back right away from the beginning. And I also appreciated the fact that when I showed up here, there was 115 employees. There was actually three of us already in the foundation. And he already knew that schools were important, were an important customer that could benefit from a company. He knew he was going to be a 30,000, 15,000 person company in the future. So he knew that he was a company. He just didn't want to sell technology. He wanted to impact what was around him. Fast forward 15 years, lots of grants to San Francisco School Unified, iPad. So he really was um, had, a, had a lot of forethought. He jokes that for the foundation, they were going to put 1% time, equity, and product in. And at the time, they didn't have the equity. They didn't have any employees to give away their time. And the product was, was still being born. And so there was no off-the-shelf strategic plan. We couldn't go on Facebook to ask a question. I think Mark Zuckerberg was in middle school at the time. We worked with these after-school programs, because getting, right, getting into the school system was, was a challenge. So we worked with Beacon Centers and some other partners. We did a lot of partnering where we could, and they provided, these other partners provided computers and access built. Um, we provided the computers. We funded the people to run the programs. I'm big, you know, you can't just give the computers. You got to hire teachers. You got to hire people to run it. Um, so it was a, it was a new, it was a very new concept. And we tried a lot of things. Some things didn't work. And um, so Mark also, we wanted to make volunteering an integral part as well. And there's a story that Mark knew that this was very important to start at the beginning. When he, again, at Oracle, he had promised the DC school systems, these NC machines, the network computers, to be installed. And they were supposed to be installed at the end of the month, which happens to be the end of the quarter. And all of you in sales, if you've ever been in sales, what happens at the end of the quarter? You're trying to close and make your number. So none of the volunteers showed up. And Mark wanted to make sure that his promise was was met so he calls up general colin powell who was his mentor who was his his inspiration for for starting this and he says general i'm in a lot of trouble nobody's showing up help me you know i want to make sure this happens he was committed and he was committed to his word so general says mark don't worry about it i'll have this hangs up the phone 20 minutes later the national guard goes to install the computers so mark knew why weren't people showing up it wasn't part of the culture from the beginning and we have some Salesforce employees here. They can attest that they were involved. They, they, they know that it is part of, the, um, part of the culture. We also had some successful failures. And those of you that are starting businesses, you know, not everything works right. And we learned from them. With these after-school programs, we were... Um, we did a lot of work with, with media and video. This is when iMovie was just coming out. It was really excited, shiny object. And we were really excited. There were two teachers in the foundation, and we, we were excited about this. And we were funding youth media, kids to tell stories. Here's a grant. Go buy a video camera and the technology. And it was really shiny object. We were grants to organizations all over the world. And we had this big idea because Salesforce thinks big. We're going to do a youth media festival and fly them all in here and do a week-long festival, which we did, which was I got to be a camp counselor for a week, which was fantastic. We raised $250,000 to put this on uh, from some partners and vendors, from Adobe gave us software. This is when software was not all delivered. Um, we had kids from London and Ireland and Japan and Hawaii and Israel and uh, Atlanta, New York, so very random. But, and it was a very, very successful event. Oh, the other good thing that we got donated was an events person I had for three weeks, which kept me sane. 
And so that, I just want to talk about pro bono donations. That in and of itself, you know, the dollars couldn't have paid for that. It was a very successful event. We're still, this was in 2004. I still have the swag and the towel I use in yoga from the, from the event. We still are in touch with some of these kids. But we left there and said, what is a CRM, cloud technology, doing with youth media? Don't get me wrong. We met wonderful people like Tony Rodriguez in, in youth, youth Speaks. But it just didn't make sense. We wanted to figure out what was our strength, and our technology was the strength. We started to hear from nonprofits who had friends or family members or partners or spouses working at Salesforce that said, this is a really cool tool for salespeople. Nonprofits need to fundraise. That's sales. Why don't you try it out? Oh, it's so expensive. But Mark saw that also. Let's give it away. Let's give away the product. And so we realized that started to be a great um, tool to get our employees involved with nonprofits and nonprofits using, having access to the, to the product. This was our aha moment. Um, the other thing that was cool is many of these nonprofits had potential customers that were, might have been board members. So it was a, it was a business kind of forethought. And employees that might not have been customer facing had the opportunity to sit with nonprofits to help them use the product. Specifically engineers, QA, developers, they could see how the product was being used in an unthreatening way with nonprofits. And nonprofits were also, many of them are very innovative and able to give feedback. Anyone here nonprofit that uses Salesforce that has benefit or about to? I know there's a handful. Okay. So what he saw, this is um, really uh, an initiative of creating shared value. And this term hadn't been coined just yet, um, but in 2011, Michael Porter and Mark Kramer wrote an article called Creating Shared Value. And it was really about integrating the business and the community and how to use your, your resources to impact society. Not just, we're going to walk, there's nothing wrong with that, but we're, or we're going to um, donate, you know, make sure we're, we're recycling. They really came up with some integrated programs. Uh, I'll give you some examples. So the reconceiving products and ideas, products and markets. So as I gave the example of, sit down, nonprofits and higher ed using Salesforce, they're using it in very innovative ways. Um, redefining pr productivity in the value chain. So Levi's has a partnership with Goodwill. If you look at some of their clothing, they have tags on there that say there it's a tag, tag, care tag for our planet. And they remind you to donate your clothes to Goodwill. And what that does, it eliminates landfill, reduces the landfill. It provides income to Goodwill when they resell it. And it provides job opportunities for people that they're training. So it's this really integrated um, business product partnership. This is this is really helpful. Another example is Campbell's, Campbell's Food, uh, the New Jersey Farmers, and New Jersey Food Bank. There was a surplus. There was there was a, not a surplus. There's about nearly a million pounds of peaches that couldn't have been sold or distributed. They weren't bad. They were just small which couldn't go on the shelves. So it cost the farmers a lot of money to have them removed. And when they were removed, it was a waste of food. It goes into the landfill. So what Campbell's did was they got together with some of their product team, and they came up with a peachy salsa recipe. And they, um, they worked with the food bank and, um, and the farmers. So they collected the peaches. They processed the food. Uh, Campbell's donated the warehouse space jars, labels, and it wasn't labeled Campbell's. But the employees, 200 employees, came out and helped with this whole process. They were then given and sold at um, like where Walmart, ShopRite, and all the profits went to the New Jersey Food Bank. See how that, they saved money, got employees engaged, um, healthy meals, uh, no cost, less cost to the farmers, um, and it provided knowledge expertise um, to, to, from the employees that they could provide their skilled based volunteering to, to build this product. Um, I wanted to, so my, I want to go back to a little bit about this, the, whoops, whoops. 
Um, back to the volunteering and making it a part of, of the company from the get-go. When If you joined Salesforce, you would come out from wherever your office was and spend two days, or a week, and two days was in a room like this, actually right over here, right across the street. And you learned all about Salesforce and who's who and security and this and that and chatter. But what they... Salesforce, that, that process, they always included the foundation, the Salesforce.com foundation, got to tell the story. And it wasn't just we got to tell the story, so it wasn't lip service. Half your day, you went out and volunteered. We had built relationships with local nonprofits nearby so we could go, and they expected twice a month a gaggle of volunteers to go and work. So it was great for the nonprofit. They knew that they were going to get not, um, volunteers. They knew how to refine their pitch. They could practice their pitch with ongoing committed volunteers. The volunteers that were there, it was really cool. So you had someone maybe from London who was in finance and an engineer in San Francisco that they will never cross their working life, but they're volunteering, either serving a meal or doing some stuff at Scrap and working with those organizations and having a conversation. So it's building that community across the company. And then when they go back to their office, wherever it is, it's not just lip service. I can bring my whole self to work and volunteer and get do a volunteer project with my team. Um, Surf for Life was a big partner. I'm pointing to Alex here. Surf for Life was a big partner because I think it was an employee brought it to the, the company. And since it was from top down and bottom up, we had a very successful um, volunteer program. And my title was VP of All Things Fun, Meaningful, and Rewarding. I wanted to show you that it does fit on a card. And how this came about was people you used to see me in the hallway, and they'd be like, oh, God, i got to go volunteer. And I knew I didn't want to be director of guilt. And I didn't want to be. <laughs> so and I, these were things when I would go out and volunteer, the light bulb would go on for them, just like those teachers that I was teaching, that it was really fun meeting. And it wasn't mandatoring. They weren't voluntold. I love these words to, to use. You know. um, so the benefits of volunteering, again, I've mentioned a few of them. Some of them are selfish, which is okay. You feel better about yourself, um, increase your sense of purpose, self-esteem, less depression. They say um, people who volunteer are 42% happier. Um, you can have an impact. Some people do it surely for recognition. But in the end, they, they come out with a lot more than just volunteering for themselves. Um, and it's like going to the gym. Who loves to go to the gym? But once you go, you feel great, right? Or once you make that time to go, or even meditating, put it on your calendar to do it. We really try to make sure that volunteering, if you were doing a team volunteer event, to put it on your calendar. And that event was as important as a client meeting. And just to really, because you made a commitment. Um, I know someone asked about skilled-based volunteering. This is the new trend. There's a lot of um, organizations, a lot of companies really leveraging their skilled-based volunteering. Their employees that have expertise, rather than just going and painting a school or serving a meal, which is still needed, they um, can bring their skills like finances, financial support, marketing support. They're more likely to raise get more skills, and I, I really committed, if you do develop a volunteer program in your company, work with the person who's also in charge of leadership development, because that can be a part of evaluations, that can be part of all of the programs that you buy to, for help with leadership development. This is easy, this is organic, it's a win-win. Uh, LinkedIn did something really interesting. They had, so salespeople don't like to leave, they need to be on their phone. They had brought in a nonprofit that told their story, told them about their story, and since they're salespeople, they're good on the phone, they learned the mission, they learned that they were doing, they were dialing for dollars. So they would call people and they helped raise money for this organization. So I thought that was brilliant. And then also the other, the most important part is the nonprofits where you're volunteering. You're doing it for them, for a need that they need. Not saying, oh, we want to, this happens all the time, we want to volunteer, we're having an offsite. volunteer next Tuesday from 3 to 5 and you 50 people, what can you do? So be really mindful, nonprofits who are in here shaking their heads. And I want nonprofits to push back and say, we would love to have you. We can't accommodate you then. I do for you. You've got to re resell it. But don't just take them because you have them. Because how many times can you paint a wall? Uh, and this, so the other thing, is, as far as volunteers goes, there's a stat uh, food bank in San Francisco and Marin. One-third of the 
42 million pounds of food that's been sorted is from volunteers, is volunteer time. So that 1,200 volunteers that come in weekly, that's saving them about three to four million dollars. So that's how, I mean, you might feel like you're not doing much, but you're really saving a lot. The other type of uh, volunteering and bonuses and, and recognition, everyone should have on their seat, you got a, a little card from Global Giving. I see some nice smiles. And um, it's a different type of bonus spent on others rather than yourself. And there's been some research done where you're directing, um, shifting the focus of the self to others. And people have really appreciated things like this. So you can give it to people, high performing salespeople, um, people who have spent a lot of time volunteering. They have, you, if you're going and recruiting on a campus, instead of giving out swag, who needs another t-shirt, that you can brand these with your company name and, and direct them to, you have the, the student, or sorry, or your, your person directed to the organization they want. This particular organization, Global Giving, they're all international cards, so you can find a project, give it to someone that you work with. You can use it for yourself or you can, you know, see how that inspires someone. The other kind of pro-social bonuses, and this is something that we started at Salesforce, were fellowship project programs. Employees on the company side, so Salesforce Foundation was a separate legal company. Um, they could spend a year working for the foundation, but still getting all their benefits and their salary from the company. And it was an application process. It was high performers, but they had an opportunity to try their skills and work in another uh, department. Cisco had done this in around 2000, 2001 when they were doing a lot of job layoffs. And instead of firing all their, or letting go all of their senior executives, they gave them a cut and said they had an option to take a cut in salary and be placed at a nonprofit and run work at a nonprofit. And then come back to Cisco when they could come back and they were able to rehire. Um, another fellowship, GlaxoSmithKline does this. They um, provide three to six months pro bono volunteering where employees can go into health related fields. There's a story of a, an employee from the Poland office spent some time in Argentina to um, build a communication strategy to combat uh, neglected di tropical diseases. So she went in there to help the organization, the nonprofit, build their communication strategy and train them so when she left they were skilled enough to, to had left them. So these are the kind of programs that companies, and then they go back and they're so re inspired, re-engaged to go back to the, to the company. Um, lots of other ways to use these cards, just back to this, VMware gives on onboarding or your um, anniversary of your, that you've been at the company. Dave and Anil at Workday, we, they gave it during the holiday, gave everyone $50 to direct. And then what happens is, so this is $50 free money, the employee will give on top of that. So you're helping, so it's almost like a match sometimes. So that's a thing that you can provide. So um, Salesforce Foundation, many of you have a nice handful of employee, uh, people here that have used the product. They donate 10 licenses. And above and beyond the 10 licenses, they provide a significant discount. And that money that they are, that for that money that comes in, that revenue, then funds the foundation, it funds additional grants, it funds the operations. So that 1% that was put in the foundation prior has since been spent down. They had to figure out how can we be sustainable without begging for money each quarter, each year for a budget. So the sales of the, the product funds that. We also, the foundation also gave grants and they gave grants to organizations that were using Salesforce. So it was to help them with um, the use of the product. And we would bring in employees to help review the grants. So they had knowledge expertise on this would work, this won't work. And they also then would support the nonprofits when they gave away those grants. So that was what Salesforce had done. Optimizely, this is a A-B testing platform. And they, they also wanted to replicate the 111 model. And there was employees that are there that are former Salesforce employees, so they took they wanted to go, next company we work for, we want to have that culture again. So that was the other thing that what Mark's envision, it was viral. These people who were leaving were taking his idea to these other companies. An example that Optimizely um, was successful in the, the Clinton Haiti fund, the emergency fund, they optimized the website and they found that they raised a million dollars more in one week because of using this product. 
and they've they had a big dot org. So same thing, and they're bringing in their. And these are small startups. There's 300, 300 people, I think, at the company. Get feedback. Another one. Two founders from Salesforce left and started it. So that product that I showed you at the beginning, that's really cool. Hopefully some of you had a, filled it out on your mobile phone because they're it's SurveyMonkey, but so much more cooler on your phone, anything mobile. And it's free for nonprofits. So they, they've taken that model, and it integrates with Salesforce, for those of you. And um, the one challenge is what happens is, and I had this conversation with Lauren, when you give stuff away for free, though, it's not always free. Nonprofits, am I right? You have to pay for getting it implemented or figuring out how to use it. So as a company, they're coming around. I know Salesforce is to providing these trainings and this support. Get feedback. Very, very small company taking phone calls and answering these questions for free product is really challenging. My suggestion, as always, I've always said, there's an organization called Year Up, Y-E-A-R-U-P, and they provide um, these for young adults 18 to 24 that might not have, they don't have the, the Ivy League school, they don't live next to someone who works at Salesforce or Google or Facebook, and they provide training to these young adults who are very, very, very capable. Um, six months in a in class, they're learning desktop support, they're learning project management, they're learning financial, depending on where year up is located. They're also learning these amazing soft skills that a lot of these kids coming out of college don't get. And they are then placed the second six months in corporations, in companies like Salesforce, Google, Wells Fargo. And they, I've, everyone that I have met is so incredibly professional, so incredibly hungry, so incredibly willing to learn. I think this is an opportunity for companies that are donating or discounting their product to get a young person like this a great career path for them to, to run these kind of programs. Box is another one. They, the gentleman, Brian Breckenridge, who is running Box.org, also a former Salesforce employee, also Salesforce Foundation, they're doing 10 donated licenses and selling above and beyond that at the 50% discount. So just sharing. Who is anyone use Box here? Okay. And I know um, NetHope, chance to talk, NetHope can provide some great uh, examples on how they're using Box. Uh, Udemy, another small startup, the HR, the woman who runs HR was at Salesforce. And Udemy is a, um, a platform where anyone can teach anyone and anyone can learn. From meditation, how to get your dog to sit, um, Photoshop, coding. And what they wanted to do was provide their platform. So it's free to, to, to put your content on here and you can charge. But they want to get nonprofits who might be global and help to train their staff knowledge out there. And they're providing small grants for people to for nonprofits to build on their platform. If you need a camera to do a videotape or, or what have you, so that they, they want to do this at the beginning. They also provided free courses during code.org week of code. Hour of code rather. So you could you could go on there and do they provided some of their classes for free. And um I this one's really interesting. SAP, so another cloud enterprise um, player, an enterprise software that manages business and customer operations. They don't have, it's, they're not a foundation. They are investing in for-profit social enterprises in emerging markets where they work, where they do business. And they are vetting and finding these for-profit social enterprises through venture philanthropy organizations like Acumen, like Ashoka. So they're investing in these organizations that, that have done the vetting, that know these organizations, but they're targeting companies that could use their platform, that could use SAP. There's an example in Brazil. So we're talking again about jobs. Um, in Brazil, 80% of new jobs are created by small businesses. That's one of their markets, small um, SMBs. One in six adults is created And this one for-profit company, um, Sol Solardium, is, uh, there's over 8 million artisans in Brazil. And what this company is doing is getting them on this platform so they can expand their reach to other consumers, JCPenney, Walmart. And instead of writing checks and helping people live better, these people are making a, a living wage because of this platform. And then Solarium has, is growing the business. So this is what, what, how SAP is, is doing all of that. And I thought that was really interesting. OK. Now, everyone loves a listicle, right? If you read those five ways to 
get a better life or five ways to, you know, not be stressed out. And these are five things to think about. And this is mainly, mainly focused towards people in the, on the business side, but I'm hoping everyone can benefit from the conversation at this point. Um, how, to, how to think about when you're starting these philanthropic programs or integrated philanthropy or 111, whatever you want to call it. Why? Why do you want to start a program? Ask yourself, what is the change that you want to make? Go look up Simon Sinek's TED Talk. Um, start with why. He's also got a website. He's got a book. And it will really, for me, driving that passion, that mission of why you want to make this change, why you want to impact, not just to, for PR. It's not, there's not wrong with that, but what is your driving thing that you want to change? Mark knew that he wanted to bridge the digital divide. He, that was a big term back then, um, and he wanted to impact education, and that was his driving force. And then the how comes second, whether it's a foundation, whether it's a department in, in another organization, that, that should come second, and let your legal people figure out how to make it happen. But you have your vision that you want to go for and, and set up. Think big and start small. Um, the story that I, I, I love to tell all the time there's a young girl walking on the beach after a storm. And on the beach were thousands of starfish. And she was walking on the beach, and she'd pick up a starfish, and she'd throw it in the water. And there were a bunch of people watching her. And she'd pick up another starfish, and she'd throw it in the water. And, you know, why was she doing this? This, this man comes up to her and says, what are you doing? You're not going to be able to save all of them. Look at them. There's thousands of them. And a little deterred, a little deflected. Those are the CEOs here. I'm sure you've heard that from VCs before, you know, telling you, well, you can't do this. She stopped, and she bent down, and she picked one up, and she threw it in again. And she said, well, I saved that one. And this man was like, huh, and she kept doing it. So he stopped, and he went down, and he started picking up, and he started throwing them in also. And all the people watching were also. So start small, what you can risks take some you know some chances and uh, think about how you can you know then get then grow it be authentic um, tell your story what is you're doing why you're doing it what challenge you want to solve what can your product actually do where does it make sense get your organizations or nonprofits share your stories with with corporations if you're using their products say hey we love this this is we would love to do more would love to see it to do this don't be afraid to share your work and what didn't work. I personally love to see, you know, what did you try, what didn't work, and what did you learn from it? Again, I'm going to call out Net Hope. I'm sure they have a bazillion fantastic stories. They were just doing, um, addressing a thing that was going on for Ebola. Where's Lauren? And Yeah, okay, so stories to learn from there because we, um, we fail from our little white towers over here, and we're trying to go into the developing world. Engineers Without Borders actually has an annual report of their failures. So be authentic. Um, listen and learn. So this is, this is the other thing that um, is really important. As a funder, you say, here we have this money. This is what we want you to do with it. Go. As a nonprofit, I really hope that you shudder and say, you know what? No, thank you. We know what we're doing. We want, this is what we can do, and let us do it. Trust us. So as funders, trust your grantees that they will do what they need to do. Hold them accountable, but let them run with what they need to run with. Um, and it, it always, I always tend to see this paternalistic parent-child kind of relationship. The checkbook writers are the ones that are up here that are telling the, the child what to do. And I really would love to see nonprofits push back and say, this is what we want to do. This is how you can help. Let's continue this conversation. Let's have these conversations. And it's a partnership. It's not, it's not a paternalistic relationship. Um, I can go into that one later. Make sure we have time for questions and, and networking. So I'll skip the Tom Shoes stuff. And then the last thing is is hire someone. You hire someone to run these kind of programs, to own it, whether it's the relationships with your nonprofits or relationships with the business from wherever you sit. There should be some someone that owns this. You can't just put a computer in the school without teaching the teachers. You can't just run this program, oh, we're going to do volunteering and 
if you know volunteering a little bit better, why don't you do this? It's not going to happen. It's not going to grow. It's not going to be integrated into the program. So consider putting some money towards a person to run these kind of programs. And there's so many hungry millennials that would love to run these programs um, that, you know, are really creative and just, you know, to be patient, give them that, that blank canvas. Uh, so I just want to come back to the origin of the word philanthropy means love of humanity and hopefully this is an idea we'll leave you with that it's not just writing checks it's not about just getting checks but it's about everyone involved and telling the stories and getting excited and doing things that are fun meaningful and rewarding thank you so um, <laughs> I'm not done. I'd love to, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, there's questions and dialogue. And I'm not going to be the sage on the stage. I'm going to call people out that could, might be able to answer questions better than I can. So uh, I wanted to ask you to please uh, ask your questions in the microphone so that our online audience can hear them as well. Any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, first of all. Uh, my question is, uh, what uh, uh, what made you decide to leave Salesforce? <laughs> um, Twelve years in one place is a long time, and I start and build something new and and find a new get re-energized with some new. I wanted to do more things internationally, and education was still my passion, so I wanted to do something with this. You can take the girl out of Salesforce, but you can't take the you can't take the sales force out of the girl, so I'm I'm still a huge fan in what they're all doing. Always with the controversial question, uh -oh. I I feel I've noticed that many of the organizations that are doing great things in philanthropy tend to have women involved and leading that charge, and I wonder. You know what is it that um, has has caused that, and and how can we support that more in other companies? Amazing woman leadership in, in corporate philanthropy. So have more women, or <laughs> have more women running the programs? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that it's a it's a great inspiration, and um, and I think that it says something that women are typically those leading that charge. The more empathetic yeah. kind of roles. Yeah. I wonder how can we use that to sort of make that more empowering and for other companies to sort of stand up and other women to also stand up and lead like yourself. Yeah. I don't have an answer to that. It's the same kind of question, how can we get more women in developer engineers and, and uh, kind of roles like yourself. So I always at a developer sales engineer at, at Salesforce, right? And had some great examples. I don't have an answer. Does anyone have a better answer than me? I, I, I honestly don't know how to answer that question, and I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Why? After giving kids, uh, after, after giving birth to kids, they have more time. They want a part time job, and then they want to build the, the society. And husband would like the wife to actually contribute to the, to the society on behalf of them. So that's why That's more what you're thinking? More, yeah, more well, these, these are full-time jobs. These are, <laughs> these are full-time. Yeah, and then when the kids are older, mm -hmm. they become mm -hmm. um, My question was, uh, you don't talk a lot about government uh, involvement in some of these programs or how to leverage them to expand your reach. Do you have any thoughts or any experience in that area? Well, I know Salesforce did have a government department they have they focus directly using that they're a great market for sales and when things are being there's a monetary value behind something they get they get the, that focus um, there's organizations that I, I want to make sure that I'm answering your question Just how do you, you leverage if you're if you're building philanthropy into your organization and you're looking at resources from outside can you leverage government to help you expand your reach you can but sometimes there's a lot more paperwork and bureaucracy working with the governments but definitely 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 bring them to the table to have the conversations because they are just as have just as much resource and knowledge as the nonprofit that's doing X Y and Z as the company has the dollars but um, the table anyone have Lauren
great talk, Julie, and I, I appreciate um, your thoughts here. And um, one question for you: so, um, coming both from the from the corporate world and from the nonprofit world, I think one of the things that I've seen happen a lot is people really struggle with the definition and how to execute a really good partnership. What advice would you have to both the corporate side and the nonprofit side? and how to think about approaching partnerships and how to lay the right groundwork to make sure that they're successful and can build over time. Great. So this is Lauren Woodman. She is the CEO of NetHope. When you ask a question, let's let's see who's in the room. I think that's really important. Um, so partnerships, I think that is, the, that is the most important and most exciting for me to make sure you're getting everyone at the table. What's your project? What's going on? What have you done? And, and bring, them, bring as many people as you can at the beginning to have these conversations. Um, I'm going to, I know Tony... Where's Tony? So Tony, that is this is your role, strategic partnerships, correct? Wait, hang on, let's get the I told you I'm going to the guide on the side. I'm getting other experts to answer my questions for me. I, I'm I'm only gonna give kind of this is on general general direction. Um, because I'm also on the board of a nonprofit and I I'll kinda answer it in that perspective first. Um, basically um, the, the nonprofit, when, when striking kind of a partnership, has to be clear about what they're willing to do or what they're looking for in return from a grant or from a partnership. Uh, so I, I think it, it, it's kind of um, two-sided with respect to the nonprofit. What, what are their goals? What are, the, what are their kind of, um, what are they willing to do uh, to achieve those goals? And from the, the, the comp company side, you know, it's going to typically fall in within uh, whoever's bringing the partnership to the table. So if it's coming out of a marketing group, coming out of a sales group, they're going to have very clear kind of um, reasons why they're coming to the, to the nonprofit. If it's coming out of the corporate uh, foundation, it'll have kind of a softer kind of general role. So I, I do think, um, and, and I'm kind of answering with the nonprofit in mind, you have to be aware of who's within the company is bringing forth kind of the partnership sure. arrangement. Yeah. Guidelines, um, I, specific guidelines, we'd probably have to do a little research, and there's experts in the field. We typically, at, uh, on the GuideStar side, kind of ju ju give general guidance. But from the nonprofit side, you do have to just be uh, aware of what group this person represents, what role within the company, and tread lightly or tread carefully around kind of yeah. what you're asking for. And, and, and not in being okay to say, no, maybe this doesn't work out for our organization. Exactly. That's okay. And so uh, you, to just to reiterate your point is know who's in the room, know who these people are. There's LinkedIn. This is a tool of, as a sales professional. Who are you talking to? And people that go into the room, make sure that y you're not going in like, this is what I want and this is the way it should come out. There's going to be, there's going to have to be some give and take. And I'm sure you have experienced that on both sides. And um, be okay to say, no, this isn't going to work sure that you have the long-term plans, the, the why, everyone in the room, make sure that that is set from the beginning, the definitions, the words, ask questions, um, maybe even do five, ten-minute meditation so everyone's just stopped and and is mindful. Does that, does that answer? And if you want to add something, have, you do a lot of partnerships. Any, ex any success stories that you have shared? I'm so making I, you answer. Yeah, I don't want to answer my own question. Um, but I, I was just really interested because, you know, I think, and to your point, um, I think the expectations is really the, the critical point, um, you know, and I'd and I, I love to see you reiterate yeah. that and bring that up over and over again. And for nonprofits, you know, to say no, um, you know, it's, it's okay for, um, I think, the, the folks in the sector to be very clear what their needs are, and frankly, for corporations to be really clear what their needs are. Those are not bad things. They're not value judgments associated with that. Um, and I just, I don't know how we, frankly, on both sides, of, on both sectors, learn how to be better about being transparent and honest about what we're frankly trying to get out of things um, and being okay with that. Because it turns out if the good is love of humanity, then I'm, you know, the incentives are there. So I, yeah. I was just curious that, yeah. you know, sort of your, your thoughts. On a lot, and a lot of the partnerships that Salesforce grew were very organic. They were employees that served on boards that were excited. You know, people that you have as volunteers go back to their company and say, let's work on this. Bring me in. That's your best way into a company is volunteers that you're working with. And um, they, you know, that that's a great way to get in. I had another thought, but it just disappeared. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, I'm Maria Franco with Children International, 
And so we just launched a new pilot in the Bay Area. And what I've been seeing is there's a lot of focus on corporate partners and on startups on local. And so we do all international work. So I'm trying to figure out, is there a place for international support? Um, and how do you message that and package it so it's urgent when it's not in your backyard? Right, that's a good question. So. Um, there are com you find companies that are multinational that might have headquarters here are doing work over overseas because those make more sense because that's going to match with their product with their people their markets and your vol where your volunteers are again if they're working at some of these companies talk to them or have them brainstorm in their network who are their customers they might be have customers that that do things that are out um, some people just want it that are volunteering they are excited about internationally even though their company isn't you have an individual. Um, that made me remind me of back to the partnership in New York Times. There's two articles that were really interesting. One that Mark wrote in HuffPo about um, activating your stakeholders. And he quotes Milton Friedman's business of business is business, but Mark disagrees with that. And he has for many years. And it's not just about your shareholders, it's not just about your profit, it's about everyone involved. So he the, the HuffPo article, and then there was another one where it was talking about peer philanth uh, peer pressure philanthropy. And um, if anyone is, knows the um, SF Gives initiative, the SF Gives. So SF Gives is a big campaign that is run by Tipping Point. Mark just decided. Mark again, big thinker. Poverty in this town. There's po we have to. How can we address it? All these big companies are coming in, and the Google buses and the Facebook buses and rents and let's solve it. And so he partnered with Tipping Point, who is a venture philanthropy organization, and they have 42 nonprofits that are in their portfolio that they have vetted. If you make it into that portfolio, you are golden. That means that you have got a gold star. And all of these organizations that are in there get unrestricted funding. And Daniel Lurie, who is um, the, fa the CEO and founder, believes unrestricted funding, you trust your grantees, and they're they're moving forward. So Mark says, we can get all these, why are all these companies here? They're living in San Francisco. They need to be involved. Every million dollars. million dollars. And he did. It's that's who he was. He is. We, you need to get on board. Didn't know what it was going to look like. Ten companies gave a half a million dollars, and they're working together collaboratively. I don't, you know, it's very new, very nascent. But that's, that's a partnership also because you have one dare I say bully, this peer pressure philanthropy and getting them all involved in the same direction and the same cause. So finding people that are really committed in that same um, mission. Hi, I'm Simone. I'm working for an innovation consultancy focusing on conscious innovation. And my question is, how did you measure the success of the organization? So sales was really um, number driven, and um, so for yeah, this is always the big pr problem or challenge with it our clients. It is a huge problem, and I can't. I don't know if I can give you a great answer because a lot of their impact they say is impact are numbers. It's we have fifty thousand volunteers and twenty thousand nonprofits, and this much money we gave gave away. Those are outputs and not really Im impact. Um, for me, it's that storytelling. It's what's needles, what needles have been moved, and that that is the magic bullet of of um, how do you, how do you measure that? I don't have the exact answer. For me, I like to these. I like to see what changes have made. This is what it looked like at the beginning, and this is where we are now, and this is how much we spent to get there. I know this is you know high level. When you find that answer, I would love to be able to. Me too. <laughs> I mean, does anyone else want to add to that? Please, I don't want to always be this sage on the stage. Thank you. When I asked for, you have does anyone answer about impact? How to report impact? Um, consulting firms and th that are actually getting into this measuring impact for nonprofits. Yep. Um, so th I mean, th there I there are people out there who specialize in this kind of stuff. And it's all going to look different, though. What do you, know, you want to? What measure matter? What measures measure? What measure what matters? Um, and so that you, you'll look at that, and the, the social impact investing also is trying to, you know, get ma that magic bullet. What does it look like? Um, for me, I always like to look at that one starfish. You know, the starfish that you have infected. I think those are important stories as well. Um, sorry, I had a question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I work for uh, Change.org, just because we're. <gasps> 
Um, so in a structure where you have you know, a big for-profit corporation that has a nonprofit arm, how do you maintain that ethical wall of, you know, because obviously Salesforce sells product to nonprofits who use the product, right? So how do you, you, know, how do you maintain that wall? It's, that's a tricky one. Um, the self-dealing, and I don't know how to answer to Workday and learning, you know, w that wall. It's very difficult. So there's pros and cons to making the nonprofit a separate legal versus putting it in the company. So half of our grant stuff for at Workday, the matching grant was in the company. That was a company budget because we didn't have to give away to specific organizations that were mandated under the foundation arm. We could match it with whoever you know, they wanted to, whereas if it was a foundation, it had to go under what our vision, our mission statement was. Um, the, the product, Salesforce Foundation set up a 501c4 to sell the product and collect the revenue, so it was a separate legal entity in that respect. So there were essentially two organizations and everyone worked for the, the C3. Um, it's, it's really, it's challenging because as a foundation, part arm of a company, and if they're giving you a grant or sponsoring of a table, you can't, they technically cannot invite employees to go unless they're working for the foundation. That's the self-dealing. A lot of these rules, I think, you know, or they're there for whatever reason. It's, it's hard to, to watch that. So what SAP was doing, they're in the business. That's all inside the business. So that's a budget line item that they're using so they can invest in these nonprofits so they get to, into the uh, Ashoka and Acumen. It's hard. You know, when people come to me, it's like, we want to set up a foundation, what we should do. And again, that's not the first question to be, you should be asking. And then there, there's some great documents out there that um, Entrepreneurs Foundation is now part of Silicon Valley Community Foundation of the different arms and what it looks like if you're going to do a donor advised fund or if you're going to make your own 501c3 and so you can compare those and there's some legal counsel out there that can help with it well I hope I answered that hi Julie hi. <laughs> uh, hi my name is Connor I work at the EdTech startup Coursera uh, where I oversee uh, industry partnerships um, I showed up a little late so if you already addressed this point please just forget me and move on to the next person. Can't forget you. Um, and I apologize to everyone here as well if that's the case. Uh, my question is in the form of a, of a thought experiment, um, and it's in the spirit of, of your comment about you know start thinking big but starting small. Um, if you could imagine that I am a individual contributor at your company, I've been on the job for one month, I don't have any direct reports, I just have my own little corner where I, you know, where I code, and I come to you and I say, you know, Julie, I want to I want to make a difference in my organization. I want to advance this philanthropic mission. I want to advance the love of humanity. How do I do that, given that I have no real sway at this organization yet? What would your advice to me be? Well, hopefully there's someone that's been hired to, that you can talk to, or leadership development. Um, I would ask you first, what is it that you're passionate about? What, do you, what problems do you want to see solved in this world? What, what feeds um, then I would love to see, let's find other people that believe in that. I think that these community groups within companies, I'm so passionate about um, hunger in our neighborhoods or education in Kenya and get these kind of groups together to then tackle this issue together and then find the right organizations that are doing the good work versus, oh, I'm already working for this organization, let's raise this money. You can, you know, what is it that you want to solve? And a lot of times the organizations will already be there because people are working with them. But I would, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there, volunteer match, we can find something for you to volunteer. Or if you want to get, you know, if you have Chatter or Yammer or whatever your internal communication tool is to say, I would love to, to start this. Will anyone come and join me? I really believe in organic or, you know, organizing things that y will happen that you had no idea could, could blow up. Anyone else? have any? Uh, hi. Um, hi, with uh, Thrive, the Alliance of Nonprofits of San Mateo County. So I have a two-part question. Quest part one is many of my nonprofits are doing ex have been for a long time. They're working basic needs kind of uh, nonprofits doing great things, but they're not sexy issues. So what I often hear is, you know, we, we're in the middle of Silicon Valley, we're in San Mateo County, so we know a lot of companies we would love to work with, 
they want to see something innovative. They want to see something never been done. They want to be part of a brand new entrepreneurial project. So how do we sex it up, these basic sex, needs? Yeah. How do you sex yeah. up mental yeah. health? How do you, you know? Yeah. So it's not meant to be funny, right? But we know, those of us in the room, a lot of us know that's a real issue. So that's part one of my question. Part two is, I also have spoken with a lot of nonprofits who say, um, Again, we know there are a lot of great companies in this area. We would love to engage their employees because we they're actually looking for opportunities for their employees. But gosh, we don't even know how to get in the door. And for companies that have matching programs, how do we even get on their list? And so, you know, how do you bridge that gap? Right. So the first part sounds like that's communications and marketing. And yes, Excels. Um, I always like to do brown bags. If you can go into an organization and, and talk their language of the company and say, this is what, what we're doing and how we're doing it and get employees involved. And even if there's a few pro bono volunteers that can help help with that, I think that's that's really important. Um, unless you have the big Mark Benioff peer peer pressure philanthropy behind it, getting into some of those those groups. And um, inviting organizations, companies to come. And it, they don't like to go a lot of places. So if you can offer, we'll do a lunch. We'll come and talk about this. A lot of companies will offer brown bags for how to buy a house or health in information. And, and that's one way to get, get people to come in and say, look, we need volunteers. This is how we could use you. And they're very clear on what is needed. That's, that's one way of getting in. Um, there's organizations like the, the Bay Area Corporate Volunteer Council where companies get together, they meet bi-monthly and talk about their program. So if you're in their system and say, hey, look, we have these, there's a listserv that goes out to everyone, that's another way to possibly get in there. Um, I know, I mean, the storytelling is so important. And if you have, again, that costs money to, to tell those stories, to make those videos, that's, that's one way to, to get that aha moment. And Alex was. Oh, sure. Um, I oh, sorry. Oh. Um, so I know that I, I hear a lot of questions about people trying to develop corporate relationships Thank you. Um, and hoping that, you know, that, that we can find a foundation or some partner in the corporate community to, uh, who oh, my you? name is Alex, um, and, uh, I'm with Surf for Life, um, uh, we're a marketing and branding nightmare. We have nothing to do with surfing. We actually <laughs> <laughs> we send people uh, all around the world to build schools and community centers, critical infrastructure. Um, but you're, I mean, at the end of the day, what I found um, is that you're not going to get a lot of these relationships tabled up to you. Um, one way is that obviously, if your employees, if their employees at a company are engaged, they're going to bring that organization in. But when I was trying to get Surf for Life off the ground, I would sneak into corporate cafeterias and talk mm -hmm. to people. And, and like I'd find out what programs would, would coordinate with what Surf for Life offered. And I'd go into like NetApp. I snuck into the cafeteria. And I sat down with people who looked around my age or younger and pretended to be younger. And I would say, hey, did you, you, know, you, did you know about the corporate volunteering program? And they'd say, no. Okay, cool. Well, you know, you can go like to Costa Rica and build a school right now if you wanted to. <laughs> and they'd say, yeah, really? And uh, I mean – it's like you have to run your nonprofit like a business, and if you want it to succeed, I feel like you have to do some of that stuff to make it succeed. Um, so, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that they have to go randomly, you know, accost people, but knocking on doors should do it any business, and yeah. I don't think that that should be separated from the nonprofit. Yeah, and that, thank you, Alex, for, for, for sharing that. Going, find, Calling up companies, like, do you have a volunteer program? I'd love to hear more. Let them talk about what they have to offer and, say, and figure out how to match it. Yeah, uh, I'm... Casey, cost of Chaudhary, I'd like to add something to what Connor said. If you are an individual, you are in a, you are in a new company, and your company is really not doing anything, you you always have the option of joining a really good nonprofit. Like for instance, I was really interested in contributing to a good nonprofit, and somehow I got involved with the leukemia lympho a few years ago, and then I got on the executive committee because. Uh, I help screen, nominate, and mentor people to stand for men and women of the year. And it's been entirely rewarding. And LLS is more efficient than most companies. And it's not the charter of a lot of companies to start nonprofit. 
I mean, Salesforce is an exception, it's best of the breed. But 90% company is not as great as Salesforce. So instead of trying to evangelize within a company, you can always reach out to very good organizations. And they'll give you a chance and you can really grow with them. I mean, that's been my take. And I think what LLS has done in advancing a uh, cure for blood cancer, if a corporate company is trying to do that, they won't be able to do that. So, so instead of trying to kind of uh, run yourself against walls within your company, just seek out uh, uh, corporate best of the breed philanthropies, which has very good reputation. And maybe your work would become the tipping point to greatness. Yeah, if you're working for a company that you have this excitement to go and volunteer, hopefully you have a company that will let you kind of think out of the box and, and bring in a blood mobile or bring bring ideas to to the organization. We had a lot of schools, like alumni from area, was, what was it, Stanford for the... There were schools, yeah, so there was... Um, a bunch of universities, so this is also great for college recruiting, they were doing their um, for small business incubators, accelerators in New Orleans. So we sent a team of employees to New Orleans to work in startups. They're mostly social businesses, though, social enterprises. Essentially, it was because New Orleans needed to the business, so any kind of economic development was, was great. And they, um, these seven, ten volunteers, employees went, and Ari just told me that she would change her life for this one little project to spend a week down there and, and coach and mentor and try and get s Salesforce. Some of the companies were using Salesforce. Some of them didn't. didn't. You know, They didn't have to, but it was a great experience for both sides. Be Nike. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Michael. Um, so I run a volunteerism and cultural immersion company for college students and uh, it's my dream to pivot that towards the corporate world and that's why I've moved here to the Bay Area. Um, my question is pretty simple because recently uh, for Indian Arrows asked me to take charge of their they do but uh, I'm really interested in how you see startups and early enterprises that don't have dedicated uh, philanthropy departments mm -hmm. um, attempting to take a stab at that right now yeah. um, for my own you know experience and what I'm trying to do and to see I'm uh, very eager to speak with any of you who are trying to incorporate philanthropy in your companies because yep. uh, I would love to help yeah it's uh, a great question there is an initiative that um, Salesforce Foundation and Full Circle Fund and the Entrepreneurs Foundation I think of Denver is all working on called pledge make the pledge and it's a it's a pledge that you make that you're gonna that you will give some of your equity, some of your your product and or your employee volunteer initiatives. You don't have to do all three, but the way I understand it is that they will help with these kind of projects. So that's a a, a think tank, if you will, or a, a resource to help build these these. And I'm I'm happy to talk to you too. <laughs> so Michael's at um, well, you still you're part of Wearable World, right? Well, any, any other questions? Any more questions? I hope you guys can talk amongst amongst yourselves because I think there's some a lot of this room, a lot of good stories. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, then thank you, everyone. Uh, there is one. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like there is one last question. Hey, Ari. Sorry, I just wanted to sort of circle back on the original question I had about okay. um, about women. Um, one of the things I'm working on is um, supporting women in, in workforce development and, and wage equity. And so definitely I'm hoping if there are organizations here who are looking to support that mission or have um, connections in that space, please just like Great. connect with me. Great. That's all. And I do, I want to have one more story. I'm actually going to call out Sue to answer Connor's um, another an example to illustrate that we were at a company meeting I don't know 500 a thousand people already in a big room and Sue was just inspired by watching inconvenient truth and raised her hand and says mark what are we doing for sustainability and environmental and being a good you know a good corporate environmental company and mark did not have an answer and said go figure it out and then she created her own job at Salesforce and she ran the sustainability program there stood up and asked the question 
Thank you everyone for coming out and Julie, thank you very much thank for being you. our guest speaker. Uh, those of you who don't have the card, the gift card, please come to me and I will give you one.